Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're thrilled to have you all with us tonight, uh, our special 50th anniversary dance talks, uh, one of our best uh, uh, attended uh, dance talks in our history, it looks like. So uh, thrilled to have you all with us tonight. Um, <clears throat> Stanton's curated a fantastic season for us, 50th anniversary season, a season that celebrates the growth of the company from its inception as a professional company to the fifth largest company in the United States today. This weekend's a centerpiece of the season with our extraordinary Jubilee of Dance, which I know many of you were with us last night. And then uh, tonight's dance talks and uh, some additional alumni events this weekend. So especially for those of you who came from out of town, you may not know that the central theme of this season is uh, surrounding works that have been created on Houston Valley. So everything on our season this year is, is either a world premiere now or was a world premiere when it first, uh, first made its way onto the stage. So created on Houston Valley. Um, and as a common theme of all these three gents with me tonight is that they were all the chief choreographers of the company during their directorships. And for those of you not familiar with companies around the US, uh, that's not the norm. Um, and the fact that Houston Ballet has been led for over 40 years by artistic directors who are choreographers is one of the very unique things about the company. And that's what's really kept the creation of new work as a central focus of Houston Ballet for nearly its entire existence. Um, I'm thrilled to have so many alum with us uh, tonight, uh, folks that I can call colleagues and friends. Uh, I was a dancer in the company 90 to 96. But before we start, I want all the alums to stand up so we can recognize you. So afterwards, hopefully you can uh, get, to, get to know some of these folks if you're not familiar with them already. So I'm honored to, to be here and talking with uh, the three artistic directors uh, from the past 40 years, um, the folks that have really stewarded this company to, to amazing heights. Um, I'm going to very briefly uh, introduce each, each of them who really don't need an introduction at all, but I will. Uh, James Clauser served as ballet master and choreographer under Nina Popova, the company's second artistic director. He was named interim artistic director in 1975 and served in that capacity uh, until 76. He created nine world premiere ballets on the company. Ben Stevenson, named artistic director in 1976, led the company for the next 27 years. In that time here, the <laughs> In his time here, the company grew from 28 dancers to over 50 dancers. 175 ballets entered the company's repertoire, and 31 of these were world premieres by Ben. And Stanton first came to the company in 1999 at the invitation of Ben uh, to create his first world premiere, Indigo. He returned again in 2000 to create Bruiser. And then in 2003, he was named artistic director. Since 2003, the company's grown to 61 dancers, 134 new ballets have entered the company's repertoire, and 33 of those have been world premieres by Stanton. So starting with you, James, going back to, uh, to the 70s, uh, you were a dancer with the Royal Winnipeg Royal Ballet. Royal Winnipeg Ballet, Ballet Theater and then Royal Winnipeg Ballet Theater before they got the name American. Okay. That's how far back. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about that journey from Royal Winnipeg to Houston? Well, uh, how I got to Houston Ballet was at the invitation of Nina Popova, who I'm sorry it's not represented here because she was the first really rock on which this company was built. She started out with a very sensible repertory with Balanchine works and modern works and who remembers William Dollar? You know, people <laughs> from our day who, you know, she really set the company up and she wanted to do Flower Festival. 
And I had been sent by the Canada Council to Denmark way back in the old days and learned Flower Festival at the font of the Bournemouth. And I was, at that time, the only person in America who was allowed to stage that and Monopoly. Uh, nowadays, it's, you see it quite a lot, which is wonderful. So Nina asked me down to stage it for the company. And she liked my work so much that the next year she needed a valley master. That was 1969. She uh, invited me to be the valley master. And I was the ballet master here. And then I went off to Sam Houston University to get my master's degree in uh, dance and kinesiology and, and returned to the company and choreographed. I think the next thing was Carmina Burano, which I choreographed. And then there was, yeah. And it's, it's still being performed. It's kind of nice. And it was a, it was a great um, moment of history. And I just wanted to ask some people here, do they remember a dancer named Kaczykowski? Some, anybody who remembers Kaczykowski who taught, this is in the days before the ballet got going. And wonderful teachers in the city like Margot Marshall and Edna Herzog, who made a, an audience for the Houston Ballet to build upon. James, upon, on, on, on that line um, of building an audience in Houston, um, when I was uh, looking through some of the old programs, I found uh, in, in the 19, April 1975 playbill, uh, there was a, a note that apparently you had written and posted for the dancers. And if you'll just uh, let me read this, I think it uh, kind of informs the path of the uh, company uh, from then on. Since my, since my choreographies are known in Houston to be more contemporary than traditional, some ballet goers may be wondering if Houston Ballet will be turning from its fairly traditional roots to more avant-garde course. The traditional and the experimental are partners. We cannot cling to one and ignore the other. Herbert Ross, the, choreographer's, uh, the choreographer of Caprichos, the only contemporary piece on tonight's program, could not have arrived at his freedom of movement and starkness of presentation without the background of classical ballet by Petipa and Ivanov. Both are represented on this program. My own contemporary ballets, particularly Conspirito, owe a deep and evident debt to my studies in Denmark and Russia, to August Bonerville's Napoli, and therefore to August Vestries, the first great male, a great male ballet dancer, a severe classicist and Bonerville's teacher. So that really struck me because, you know, during my time uh, with Ben and certainly uh, the tradition we've carried on um, since Ben with Stanton has been an equal split of our repertoire, three, three programs, mixed reps, mostly contemporary work, and three classical ballets. And so it was very interesting for me to read you know, this, this kind of I'd message. I'd forgotten that. Um, um, I was well spoken yes. in those days. <laughs> it's in print. Um, so you, you kind of mentioned your time uh, first as a ballet master. Um, so other than the staging of, um, of the Bourneville work, uh, what was the impetus to creating your own work here on Houston Ballet? Well, Conspirito, which was uh, kind of a landmark ballet of the company becoming unified. Up until that point, people weren't interested in going to the regional companies if they could go to New York and hang out and maybe I'll get in one of the New York companies. And f brave ones would venture out to the regional ballets to get their experience. And so the company didn't have yet a unification of a school. They were all from a hundred different schools. And so I made Conspirito uh, to unify the company's port bras and to use what I had learned of the Vaganova Portobro and the Conspirito for all its, what people like loved its lightness and everything, was a study in the use of Vaganova Portobro to draw all the companies together to all move in the same way. And uh, because the designer, Sonia Zarek, put them in 
colorful uh, shorts, colors of, of uh, ice cream, raspberry and lime and uh, orange sherbet colors. And they were the first time shorts were hitting, you know, used as costumes. People thought it was about tennis. <laughs> <laughs> and it really was, I mean, there's a picture in, in the Dance Magazine in 19, I forget when, Suzanne Shelton from Austin did a big thing on us, of the company in this FSA position. It was Vagana, but <laughs> unmistakable. James, you'd mentioned uh, your Carmina Burana. Um, another ballet that folks talk about is Caliban, and that was your first full-length ballet on the company uh, based on The Tempest. Um, and I think that we've got a few images here. Also, what I found very interesting is, uh, is the use of uh, the musical choice that you, that you made to accompany the, uh, the ballet, um, the group St. Elmo's Fire. The Henry Holt, who was the company manager at the time, and he was the one who insisted that you had to do Nutcracker if you were going to be a company. That was going to be your bread and butter. And he had saved the Boston Ballet with a Nutcracker. And then he came down here, and he and Nina fought. She, she said, we're still a bunch of regional kids, and we're not really unified as a company, and we shouldn't expose ourselves. And he won the fight and they did the Nutcracker. And so when we were getting into uh, Caliban, Henry, his next step was, we got to do a rock ballet. And I was not a jazz dancer at all. I was not good at jazz. And, but we searched and searched for people. And I, Bira Paredes, which is just on the corner here, <laughs> then they were up on West Green, not far from the the ballet studio, and they had live acts, and I heard this group called Wheatfield. They were it. <laughs> and I have to tell this fun story. There was Chris, the one of their players, he was like six foot ten. He was <laughs> white hair, just very imposing. And Sonia dressed him as a Viking. And he the ballet world was totally new to him. And his business manager said, after this performance, you must go to the green room and meet the press and meet the public. And he was in this Viking outfit. And he said, I'm not doing that. I'll be so embarrassed. I don't know what to do. And then he had second thoughts. And he said, well, I better do it. But he thought he meant the restaurant, which is on the corner by John's <laughs> Hall. And there he plowed in, six foot ten as a Viking, looking, <laughs> looking for the public. So we had some wonderful times with that. Yeah. So switching to you, Ben. Um, in February 1976, three preludes came into the repertory. Um, did you set the piece before becoming artistic director here, or was that the first first? Work? I did. Yes. I was directing the Harkness Ballet. And that's the first piece. I chose my first piece that was done professionally. So it meant a lot to me that when we're still doing, people are still doing it. Yeah, like last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what was your impression of the company and the city? Had you been to Houston before? Um, when I was with the Royal Ballet, we toured, we came to Houston. So I'd, I'd known the city before, but uh, not until I lived here did I really get to enjoy it and to know it. I want to say one quick thing about Jim, actually, because when I came here, and he was so popular with the dancers, so it was difficult me coming in. And one of the critics wrote in the newspaper, they got rid of GS and hired BS. <laughs> got rid of JC and hired BS. <laughs> that was one of the best reviews I ever had. <laughs> So Ben, um, <clears throat> and we have uh, some images here of the leading dancers, the principal dancers, when you first joined the company. And I think it's interesting to 
for the audience to, to, to see uh, their images, their names, uh, especially because we'll have some references. You probably can't see. It's Jennifer Holmes, Suzanne Longley, Ken McCombie, Janie Parker, Dorio Perez, Billy Pizzuto, Dennis Poole, and Andrea Vodinal. Um, the, the dancers in 1980 that were the principal dancers of the company. Um, what, which of the dancers did you bring? Which of the dancers were here when you came? Um, I think that, um, I think most of them, I think most, um, yeah, I did. Andrea, Andrea was already here, yeah. She's so beautiful, she was already here. Is Suzanne here? She was here last night. She's not here. And Janie is not here, so. No, it was, a, it was such a nice group. So Ben, you also brought many new choreographers to the Houston Ballet repertoire. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your choices of bringing Christopher Bruce, um, uh, Sir Kenneth uh, McMillan, um, um, uh, Killian, uh, for the first time to Houston, to Houston's repertoire? I think because they were so outstanding in their field and very different. And of course, I'd worked with Kenneth McMillan in the Royal Ballet. So I, I loved his work. And, so I, and he was extremely famous. So somehow, to get him to come here and rub off on the company, I thought was important. And actually, he became associate artistic director here. Um, Christopher Bruce, Dynamite, and his work was really ex fantastic. And I'd known him as a, a boy. In fact, when I used to go to class, Errol Addison's and Andy, he'd come and always stand behind me. At the, and he was like 14 and I was 85 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I'd known him for such a long time and a brilliant guy. So getting him here was marvelous. And Yuri Killian, who wouldn't want Yuri Killian's work? I mean, brilliant. So those were three particular people I wanted to work with the company. And also the diverse. Uh, thing of having such different choreographers really expands the, the knowledge of your dancers too, so that's wonderful. Right. I think uh, when Christopher first came to the company, it was a real turning point in, in the diversity of, of how the company was able yeah. to move and the rep that they were able to handle. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the premier works that you created on the company. Uh, Pierre Ghent, I think, uh, being one of the, the first full-length mm -hmm. um, original titles that, uh, that you created here. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that came to be and, um, and coming up with, uh, with the, the concept of, of Pure Ghent as a, as a full-length uh, ballet? The idea actually started in, um, when I was with Harkness, and I wanted to do it for Helgi Thomason, who was one of the dancers there. Then, because <clears throat> I left, Harkness came here, and... Um, so then I always had that on the back burner, as it was, as an idea. And then when I got Ken McCombie, who is such a wonderful artist, actor, that I thought this would be a perfect role for him. Also, I had the idea, ideal people to do the other roles. It always helps. You don't just swan leg if you don't have a swan queen, you know. So I thought I had the right people to do the ballet. And so it's one of the most fun uh, pieces I had to do because it's quite a difficult story to tell and um, because the, everyone knows the music and was that your first uh, ballet with Peter Farmer was that the beginning of that long relationship or had you done other work with Peter I had before? done Cinderella with him okay. before but I'd done a lot of work with Peter so wonderful um, the other work that uh, folks will recognize as their original new work is Dracula um, and that, um, uh, what what brought that to what brought that to your mind as far as a, a new full length ballet? <laughs> I looked in the mirror once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I just thought it was, you know, you want you. It's difficult to do ballets that are going to be interesting, but at the same time, you don't want to do a. It's so. It's also important to have ballet. Some of the ballets that sell tickets, so they got to have a recognizable title. And I thought well, a lot of people knew Dracula, so I thought I'd have a go at doing Dracula, so that was fun. And I had Tim O'Keefe, who might be here today. Um, 
And I remember, I remember when I finished the piece, he said, oh my God, he said, I thought it was a mime roll. <laughs> and Susan Cummins here too somewhere. Yes, she is. <laughs> so those were the people that guided me through the choreography. They were so great. And uh, we talked a little bit about the partnership that you had with uh, Peter Farmer. Uh, this uh, Dracula was with uh, Lanchbury, and you had worked with uh, John Lanchbury uh, many times. Was this the first original work? I mean, not an original score, but a compilation that you've done with him. Yes, he was one of the things. I've done several things with him. He was such a such a brilliant man. He's so new ballet. And when I did Dracula, I thought, when I get to the end, you know, he sort of burns up in this lamp. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But it's a sort of gory end. And so I thought, you can't really have the young lovers aren't going to want to stay in that place and do a pas de deux after this. <laughs> so I thought, I'm not going to do a pas de deux. I'm just going to end there. So as I got to the end of the ballet, I thought I made a huge mistake. There has to be something a resolution between the two of them. There should have been a part of the, and um, Lanchby said, "I know, I did one for you." <laughs> <laughs> so Stanton, switching to you now, um, <clears throat> your first year as our artistic director, uh, Tales of Texas um, was your first full-length ballet. Um, that wasn't the first season, but that was your first full-length uh, It was work. the first season. It was the first yeah. season. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how Tales of Texas came, uh, came about? Sure, from Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because Ben had hired me to, to make a full-length for the company. And that, that ballet uh, ended up being Tales of Texas. And it premiered in that first year as director. And it was uh, trying to find uh, local themes and subjects and make an evening of Texas-themed short stories. So there was a ballet to Patsy Cline and a ballet to Copeland Music about pioneer people. And then the final ballet, which was the story of Pecos Bill. So uh, we're skipping a lot of material tonight, really focusing on original new works. And so you know, there's, there's a lot that we're leaving out. Um, but um, one of the things uh, that I think many people will recognize is uh, in your full-length ballets, um, how the female characters are focused on, the, the ballets are focused on very strong women as central characters. They're not, uh, they're not women that need to be rescued. Um, Marie, Cinderella, um, Sylvia, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why? When, I, when I've been asked that, I think um, it, it's, it's being raised by a single mother. With, uh, who was the artistic director of the Australian Ballet and a principal dancer and had two boys and she just did everything. So uh, it, it, it felt very much that uh, that was just the world that I, I understand of, of those characters, I think. Because uh, even in Sylvia and, and, and uh, Marie and uh, Butterfly, all of those characters, they, they need to make their, the decisions and drive the decisions themselves. Even if something terrible happens to you, the role of Juliet can be quite a feisty character. She's not, she, she makes choices, she does things. So I think that that is uh, just bringing that kind, of, uh, that kind of power to each of the characters. So when you've created uh, works like uh, Bayadere or Swan Lake, obviously there's, there's a reference to start with. Something like Marie, while there's historical context, there's not, there's not, a, there's not a, an existing ballet. Uh, so how do you come up with the narrative of how you want to tell that story over, over three acts? Um, well, I think Marie was a very unique experience for me because I didn't come with a story before. It started with the documentary that I'd seen and there was uh, telling the story of Marie and all the things that you had misunderstood about her as a character and, and stories that had been made up about her that weren't really true. Um, and that really had changed my, my view of her. And there was one particular moment where she was taken to the border between Austria and France and she was stripped of all her clothing. Her puppies were taken away, her toys, her nannies. And then they only dressed her in French product because they felt nothing that she'd had before. 
and how traumatizing that would be for a 14 year old as your entry into this new kingdom. And that inspired me and there was this piece of Shostakovich music that I'd been listening to that told that story, told that moment, told me how I think she would have felt and then the arrival into Versailles and then uh, it was a matter of finding pieces like that. I was lucky enough to work with Jack Lanchbury too and he introduced me to Shostakovich music and uh, I knew what uh, I, I knew what sort of uh, library there was, and I just uh, pulled together pieces that meant something, and then actually framed the story around what that music said to me, and, and pulled parts from history. And so many of you are familiar with Sylvia that we uh, that we launched last year. Um, the telling of Sylvia is different than the existing versions. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you intertwine the three different love stories? Uh, to, to create your Sylvia. Sure. Uh, it, it's too complex a story to explain the story. But uh, I took uh, the original ballet concept, which is quite a light story, really, the original Sylvia. There's not a lot of meat to it, but fantastic music. Um, and then I took some Greek mythology, the characters of Psyche and Eros and uh, Artemis and Orion, and wove their stories into the story of Sylvia. So even though the balletic Sylvia is still there as an arc, you now also follow these Greek myths uh, in all three acts. And uh, it was just as Ben had said, you know, you get inspired by the company and, and having a ballet where you have three lead characters, three lead couples, and each of those couples have a villain. Uh, that gives me nine lead roles in a ballet and that, that helps and I think uh, is exciting and, and inspiring. So each of you have um, experienced working in a city and a company uh, that has given you the wings to create new works, um, boards that have said yes to experimental work. Uh, that's not the norm everywhere. Uh, we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit from each of you kind of about key moments uh, during your time here um, where that was the case. Well, I want to tell an interesting story about that. Uh, there's always a little problems going on with the union and the management. You know, and the union wants to do right and the management wants to do right. But what is right for them, often it cross purposes. And that went on a lot. And we were, in my time, when we were delving with developing audiences and how are we going to reach audiences? And we wanted to do appearances in malls and different places and go out. But those had to come under the, the hours of rehearsal. And if we gave it up for development, it became, took away from rehearsal time. So uh, I decided we would rehearse in the malls. <laughs> and we went around to all the malls and they set up the floor and Allen's Landing, which was my Texas tribute, uh, was choreographed in the Southwest Mall. <laughs> and Hugo Fiorato, who came to conduct Carmina Burana for us, saw it first in a mall. Took him down in a cab, and here it is, and we danced it in a mall. And I remember a wonderful story that down at that Southwest Mall, some woman came up to me after the first time, and she said, this is fascinating. I didn't know this was going on in Houston. And the next year we went down, and she came up to me and she said, do you remember me? I just joined the Women's Auxiliary. And the third year she came up and she said, I just won the award for raising the most money <laughs> for the Women's Auxiliary. And I think that was important to reach into, to learn what, how the city felt. And even though it started out with a lot of privileged folk who had managed to host the Ballet Russe and the glamour of those days, it turned into a company that, well, I noticed this last night, the appreciation of a performance in which nobody was mugging, nobody was trying to falsely impress the audience. This, wonderful use of the music and the floor and quality. And here they are giving you a standing ovation. Now that's, that says something about Houston. Yeah. 
Ben, thoughts on, uh, I, I, I remember in the documentary, one of the things that you commented on was what an amazing board that Houston has and, and the support that they gave you in the creation of, of work, even experimental titles. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think what was unique, I think, about Houston Ballet is it started with a group of ladies who wanted a ballet company here. And I think Ballet Russe came every year and they were inspired by that. And so they really wanted to have a company, so they got together and to form a, this ballet company. So it didn't start from an artistic person. It didn't start from a choreographer or uh, someone who uh, was going to do, express themselves and then gather a few people around. It started with people who wanted the company, and I think that was unique. And so also people would come forward. I mean, when I did um, Pierre Gint, it was because, I mean, I, I don't like to say this, but um, Tony Arnold it was at the time came, and she, she said that she and Isaac wanted to give ballet for me to do, a, a money for me to do a ballet of my choice. I'm sure this happened to you. But it, um, it was, I thought, oh, how nice, you know. <laughs> so and that's how I got to do a P again. But no, it was, it was outstanding, outstanding. And Stanton? Uh, I certainly, uh, when I first came here uh, and visited the company when Ben was director before I even choreographed, I had uh, friends in the company that I had visited here. And there was always a sense of uh, adventure in Houston, I think, creatively. It feels like you can be brave and we're on the frontier of making great work. And uh, I think that's an exciting place to be. And uh, I think that's because of what these men and, and Nina and Simonova have built. And uh, it's also, though, the city supports the arts and it feels like uh, it's, it's not mugging, it's not commercial, it's about creating something here like this building that will be here long before, after all of us have gone, uh, that it's a monument to classical ballet. And there aren't many cities in the world that have a building like this built for classical ballet. Um, and that's, that's really a powerful thing. So with this many people, I know that we need to give extra time for questions. So I want to open it up to questions from, from our audience. Uh, for James and, and Ben and, and Stanton. Yes. Uh, he's asking where else Carmina Burana was staged. Uh, Washington Ballet has done it. Uh, ballet Company in Nebraska. Several university dance departments have done it, and we've done it in. Uh, University of Arizona, from which I recently retired, quite successfully, and uh, just carrying on that tradition and finding the right recording <laughs> to use for it. I don't know if you remember a man named Rosecrans, who was a conductor here. He would take that at a clip, and the dancers would be scared, but it was so exciting the way he did it. And now, Carmina has had a life since here. I I don't know. Um, I've just actually this year I've just done a brand new production in China and a few weeks ago, um, a production in Buenos Aires. So Cinderella, she's quite an old lady now. <laughs> she's joined the Ugly Sisters, I think. But she's, um, it's amazing how you do a ballet, like you were saying, coming in around with them, how you do something. And either, the thing about doing a ballet, I often say this, which is a bit disheartening, is when you go to do a ballet, you don't know if it's gonna be a triumph or a failure. And so it's like gambling, I always say this. And then sometimes people say, well, could you, if we pay a bit more, could you do a good ballet? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. But um, Cinderella was the first full-length ballet I did for the Washington Ballet. And, um, 
and I had the wonderful Margot Fontaine. We toured with it for a long time. So it was, it was an important work for me. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. So I was wondering if each of you had a favorite ballet. Paul Legrove, principal dancer. Sorry, Paul, can you, can you say that one more time so everyone can hear? I was wondering if each of you had a favorite ballet that you had choreographed, and if each of you had a favorite ballet that you wish you had choreographed. <laughs> well, I would say it's always the next one. <laughs> but um, I've had a lot of popular ballets, and I've been proud of them, the ones that were really good. But I also ran a small dance company here for a while with some local dancers who were maybe more modern than ballet. A few of them had been in the Houston Ballet and danced with me. And some of the works I created for them, uh, a dancer named Susan Sanders, some I know, and a piece called It's Here, in which she spoke and, and she would say to her, the man, it's here. And he would say, it's there. It's here. They had this huge argument and she was a brilliant comedian. And inspiration to me. In the end, he dragged her off by her hair, <laughs> saying it's here, and she's going, it's there. And <laughs> that's one of my favorite pieces, and not many people remember it, you know. Stanton? Oh, uh, sorry, um, I think probably the, I, the, the last one that I've worked on is really the one that you feel most connected to, so that for me was Sylvia, and we just finished that here and, uh, and taught it in Australia, and uh, that was a lot of fun, and, uh, and, and the music is so sensational, I think. I sort of have two equal, equal works, I think. One was for our songs, which I enjoyed. And, <laughs> and uh, I had the wonderful Andrea Vodenal, who did the final solo, which was beautiful, I think. And uh, I've enjoyed doing that. And also the Mozart Requiem, which I did for 11 guys in Fort Worth, and that's, it's meant, so, it's working with the dancers means something, and so some, sometimes um, when you've done something, you've sort of given something to them, and it's what they do with it that's exciting, and so those two pieces, um, I owe a lot to the people who danced it at the beginning, because they were, gave themselves to it. So the other part of Paul's question is uh, a work that you either wish you had done, and Stanton, I guess that means a ballad that you're planning to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do I wish I'd done? Or a ballad you, you did not choreograph, but you love. On Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, for me, the ballad that I wish I had choreographed was Ashton's Month in the Country. Yeah, oh, beautiful Lord, ballad. Yeah. I just saw that, so beautiful. Okay, another question. <laughs> <laughs> They're not letting you off, Ben. I think it would have to be, I don't know. <laughs> Fee My God is a wonderful ballet, I think. But oh, um, yes. Manon, I think, is a fabulous work. So, Manon. <laughs> yes, right here. I love the Nutty Nutcracker. <laughs> Nutty Nutcracker. <laughs> Do you know, we, start, we started Nutty Nutcracker here, and at the beginning, I remember, and the last day of the Nutcracker, someone would come in with their teeth blacked out or something. <laughs> so I'd be furious, I'd go around and say, the audience had paid the same money that and they'd always do little, little jokes with the laugh. And I said, we're gonna do a funny nutcracker. You can do what you like in it. And so we've got, we can have that for that evening. So it started off with a few pranks, but now it's in where, we, where I am now, it is a full out extravaganza. Nothing of the nutcrackers left. <laughs> <laughs> and so the dancers really get on board. It's a, I'm just so amazed. What an incredible job they do. It's up, become our biggest ticket seller. You can't get in. It. It's a world premiere every year. It's a world premiere. Thank you. It is. <laughs> so another question. Yes, right here. This is for Stanton. I heard you speak when you first arrived here, and you said you wanted to build the kind of company that would attract the top choreographers. Do you feel you've done that? 
Do I feel I've done it? Yeah, yeah certainly. I, I think that's what this year was celebrating. Um, it was like building last night. It's very tricky because you start to look back through uh, the history of a company and there's really what you're doing is leaving things out all the time. So I wanted to make sure that this year was a look back at all the mixed rep programs have ballets that were made on us by uh, Mark Morris, Justin Peck, uh, Yorma Elo, uh, uh, James Kadelka. Um, then, of course, Ben, we have the full lengths, and uh, then also three new works so that we were also moving forward with that same, that same concept. So it was, kind of, it was very much about looking at that and, and acknowledging that. And uh, a lot of those ballets that we're repeating this year that were done on us have been sold to other companies, um, and that always feels like that, that's successful, right? And uh, a, a ballet is a fingerprint from a dancer. They, they leave something, a mark on a ballet, and that is forever. And uh, it, that's what it makes it so special, I think. Another question. Yes, Andrew. So um, let me paraphrase it. It was about uh, uh, the creation of Company B, and did you have any uh, apprehension about, uh, I guess, a classical ballet company like Houston Ballet taking on uh, that very contemporary idiom? Is that fair, fair, fair way? Okay. Um, actually, with um, Paul Taylor, he when he he did this, he choreographed it on his company and then sent someone here to teach it to the company because we were going to premiere it. And then he came at the last moment and did his little magic on it. So, no, I think that the dancers really took to it. So amazing. Um, there was such an exciting premiere um, in Washington, D.C., at the Kennedy Center. Very exciting premiere and exciting to do work. But I think that, I think dancers, now when I was a dancer, with Anna Pavlova all those years ago. <laughs> it was, um, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't do the contemporary works people do now. People that did contemporary work sat on that side of the room. People that did ballet on this side, we were like <laughs> looking across. And now that's gone like that, which is so exciting. It's melded together so much. So the new works, contemporary works, have developed such wonderful choreographers, I think. And, um, so I think that we've got so wonderful years ahead with, with new works by fabulous people. Did yeah, I'd like just to, to uh, take an aside on that with talking about Company B. Sometimes as modern choreographers got older, and the same thing happened with Mr. B, that they became a little more sentimental a more classical of Taylor's last works were very structured and mm -hmm. very balletic. And it suited the American style, as you were saying, that mm -hmm. was starting to develop. And now, uh, I'm just retired from the University of Arizona, which has bridged that gap. We have a, a very strong men's program, and we're performing Company B next year on the college program, and with, you know, and not. He wouldn't let it go if we weren't good enough. Yeah. So the, the world has changed in that way. And mm. there are so many more wonderful dancers in the world who bridge that gap and make the, mm. those wonderful works available to everybody and not just the ones lucky enough to come to see you do it. Another question. Yes. Yeah, I think I'd, um, I grew up with European choreographers, dancers, and then coming here, the difference. No, with Lee Swin Lee Singh. Swin Singh. Oh, Lee Swin Singh. That Chinese guy, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, um, Lee, well, Lee was amazing because um, he, when I went to China, the very first time, all those hundreds of years ago, that um, the students were like sponges. 
And I remember the very first class I went to, the windows were snow and ice. And they were in little, there was no heating. They were in little shorts and t-shirts in class. I was wrapped up in everything I wore, took with me, I wore. And it was amazing how they took down notes and things like that. Lee was very studious and very smart. And um, when he came, he was a great student, a great learner. He wanted to learn everything he possibly could. He was not at the beginning a great actor, um, but worked so hard on his technique. But then, then he could just took everything, so he became a great artist, I think, in the end. And I think he's got a lot to pass on. I think he just became now an American dancer. I mean, I don't look at him anymore. I mean, he's Chinese, but I think he's taken the world in his stride, I think. So he's taken all that in, which is great. Was that a good answer or a bad answer? Good answer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Another question. Yes. I think uh, a, a great ballet uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a great dance. I don't think it needs to be defined necessarily by classical ballet or contemporary ballet or modern dance. I look at works by Yuri Killian, which is really a, a contemporary style, but his classes, his dancers learn classical ballet. They, they work in that style. Um, so I think the good ballets are, are quite clear quite quickly. And you want to make sure that um, then it becomes about money and scheduling and getting the person here and making sure we have the right cast and, and all of that kind of stuff. But the really good choreographers sort of filter to the top, I think, pretty quickly. When it, when it, I mean, there was one time when Balanchine's Serenade was a new work, you know. And now, if it's a good work, it immediately becomes a classic, really, because it's going to be done for a long time. So... Um, it's very interesting how the works that were, we thought were so contemporary, like the Beatles when they came up, thought, oh, and now they sound like a heavenly choir compared to some of the <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I kind of look for uh, honesty. If, if a dance is honest in its conception, whether it's female garde, which is mm -hmm. a brilliant thing, or three epitaphs by Paul Taylor, which is, you know, the Taylor dancers said, who knew how hard it was to schlump all the time and everybody's bent over and it's quite unusual about it, but it's an honest work. And if the work is not pretending to be something else, it's worthy of anybody's attention and accolades. Yes, Chrissy. I think, I think by examples, um, talking about your own personal dealings with roles and what you've learned over the years, um, you've, learned, you've learned to strain things. Two things I learned from Margot Fontaine, which I thought she was crazy when she told me, but now I, she's totally sane when I think about it. <laughs> One was she said, if you, can't, if you don't use your eyes, you can't dance. <laughs> but it's true, if, you, if your eyes, if you don't, contact the audience, then, you know, if you don't have that, then you can't. And the other thing she said, how stillness was important too. How stillness. 
was important in, in something. And those things are true. But I think uh, with Lee, you just, I think it's almost like directing a movie or something. You know, you say to someone, you know, I want, sometimes I've said to people, you know, like, I want you to sing dum de dum de dum go across the room and do that. And they go, no, I can't. I want you to go dum de dum de dum do that across the room. No, I can't. And then in the end, they go dum de dum de dum across the room. And in the end, they're going dum de dum de And then you sort of have, if they can, I said, now, if you can do that, you can do anything. So somehow, it's getting people to, I think humor helps too. It did me. Humor helps. Unless it's too so tense and thing, you, nothing comes through. But I think it's um, letting people feel that they can express themselves. Because if I've, I think acting is so important, even because you're expressing the music. You know, so somehow to express is something that's what you're doing down here is going to come through and out through your eyes. Thank you, Margot. Out through your eyes. I think not all ballet companies practice acting, right? And that's certainly something that Ben did and something that I do, and I think that was something that I recognised that was similar about Houston Ballet to the Australian Ballet or to the Royal Ballet, that acting and people who could act were important and you have to practise it and you can't just say, I can do it on stage. You have, to, you have to do it in the studio and be there and be real. But Ben's also a great actor. So you can watch Ben act and learn from watching him act. And I know that uh, just in watching him demonstrate or do a character role in his ballets, he can transform from Catalibut to, to the Queen, to Aurora, <laughs> to whatever the character may be, and, and, uh, and, and can do it with his face and with a simple gesture. And so I think a lot for dancers is about watching someone like that do that. Uh, and I certainly, I think that that was a large part of what helped, is, is watching Ben act. Yeah, I think Ben said earlier, you don't do Swan Lake if you don't have a Swan Queen. Yeah. And you either have a dancers who can do that kind of acting, and I think the structure of the work, you mentioned humor, and you, if you know Shakespeare, you know there's no, no tragedies without humor, and that has to be built in so you can find those dancers and I've done 12 full-length ballets in my career, and I look back and they're all based on a Petipa model. There's an introductory, something happens, a dream sequence, a denouement, and it, it helps the story sell itself. And people may not realize when they're seeing it that Caliban was based on Petipa. <laughs> and uh, I was very lucky to have dancers at that time who could do those acting roles, and one of the most difficult things about being a freelance choreographer is you do a hit in Dallas, and they had the guy to play such and such a role, and so somebody in Greensboro says, I'll pay you to come and do it, and they don't have the cast. <laughs> and, you know, and you'd have to be there much more time than you have. So it, it, it's a trepidatious world out there. <laughs> So I think we have time for about one more question. Right over here, Beth Gaither. Oh Lord, I have to use this, hello. Um, this is a question for all of you um, and I would say it's probably coming from most of us out here that are teachers now um, in this crazy era of social media and YouTube and the evolution of, you know, ballet and now the evolution of the athleticism that's required and the tricks that are required. For us teachers, how, what, what would you suggest to help these kids to continue the path of the purity of the art form comes first? the artistry, and the other comes second, because nowadays it's like, you know, the more pirouettes I do, the, then the better dancer I am, but they're losing the artistry. They're losing the purity of the classical line and the art form itself. And this is a big challenge, I think, for all of us right now. Well, in Houston Ballet Academy, I think that uh, 
there is still a, a focus level that we have. Um, and I, I certainly know that. I mean, the school is very much a part of what Ben has. And the wor work ethic and discipline in this organisation has always been profound long before myself. That was through Ben, you take class very seriously. The dancers here really listen. Uh, you know, we have people like Billy Forsyth come through town and talk openly about how amazing it is to give corrections on details rather than just trying to control a room all the time. So, but how, what the solution is, I don't know. And I think that the phones uh, play a negative and a positive part at times because they give them access to Fontaine and to Sylvie and all these people. But the negative is you don't sit down and watch someone else dance. And that, to me, is, is the thing. But uh, it is, as another school, it's a challenge and uh, it's something that you have to navigate through. But I just want to say on behalf of Houston Ballet that there is certainly this sense of, of very disciplined class concentration from the school all the way through to the company and that was from here when I came as a young dancer myself. It was just class is, is real. Yeah, it's uh, coming out of the uh, academic field where I've been a professor of dance. That's a big problem, that the students are down here in their thing and they're not seeing anything. They're very enclosed. But then I think uh, about it, the, you were talking about the demands of dancers today. It means that those who can give that up and who go ahead and see what's really happening become better and better. Mm. And that's how they rise to the top. And the ones who are gonna be stuck in their iPhones are gonna be stuck in their iPhones and probably wouldn't be competitive in the professional field anyway. So it, it, it works a knife that cuts both ways for us. I think with male dancers too. There was a young man called Mikhail Borishnikov who came <laughs> and was so amazing the technique was so amazing. And so then people started saying tricks. I never think it looked like a trick when he danced. It, he danced, he was so musical, and so he just flew through the air. Then they became tricks because people couldn't really do it. <laughs> so somehow they had to work so hard to do double cabriole. I had a boy in the, in the summer school in Fort Worth, and he, his name, uh, his, um, name was Lil Carlos Acosta, which he wasn't. <laughs> but he could, he could do double cabrioles, which is like beating legs like that. I mean, the biggest double cabrioles I've ever seen, but he couldn't do anything else. <laughs> and he said, I've, I watch this every night when I go home. I put Carlos on and I watch that. And so um, I said, you know, dancing starts, that starts with a plie and a tendu, and when you do those beautifully, you'll move on to the next step, but you're not in the double carriole. That's a good question, by the way, thank you. I want to thank the three of you uh, for being with us tonight. <clears throat> really extraordinary time in the company's history. Seeing the three of you on stage last night was uh, one of the highlights of the Jubilee. And uh, I think everyone here joins me in, in their adoration and uh, appreciation of all that you've given Houston Ballet for decades. Thank you.